Welcome to Liberty Action Alert with Greg Seltz. Sponsored by our friends at the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty here in Washington, D.C. A program that cuts through the chaos and confusion in the culture today by talking to kingdom citizenship. Bold biblical principles for a robust public Christian life. And now your host, Dr. Greg Seltz. Good day, good day, Washington, D.C., and friends of the program all around the country. I'm Greg Seltz. Welcome to Liberty Action Alert. Today in our program, we are privileged to have again with us Jeannie Mancini, the president of the March for Life. The March for Life is the largest human rights protest in the world, and it's part of a growing sanctity of life movement. And she's been a phenomenal leader. We've the LCRL, the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty, has has supported this every time every year we've been in existence, and our LCMS church obviously has been behind it for a long, long time. Welcome, Jeannie. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Greg. I'm very honored. Well, listen, I, I think I needed to talk to you because uh, I have not spoken to you since the Dobbs uh, case and the Dobbs ruling. So I just want to start there. Where were you when you heard heard the result that Roe was overturned? What does it really what does it mean for the pro-life movement at this moment in time? OK, great question. So where was I? Well, <laughs> right. I was at the Supreme Court uh, right before it was announced. So Anne Claire from our staff and I were down at the Supreme Court doing some videoing and I could tell something was different that morning. It was Friday morning of June, June 24th. Um, and the birthday of the founder of the March for Life, by the way, Nellie Gray, the birthday of, of Nellie and wow. the fencing and just kind of the energy, something did seem different. And right. I had been asked to be ready to hop on to CBS um, wow. on the day the Dobbs came down and I was getting messages to stay very close to a laptop. So, um, so we left and went to my office and got in here right at 10 and the decision came down about 10 10, 10, 10, 10, 11. Right. And so I was sitting uh, in my office right in front of the laptop, just reading the decision. And I was sort of live on CBS and reading the decision simultaneously as that was happening. And then I could see, you know, the on the reporting, the crowds were starting to gather at the Supreme Court. There were a few, it was a little bit crowded in the morning when we were there, but it got much more crowded as the day went on. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is, so I was outside, I was outside uh, in the middle of that crowd. And wow. what's, um, yeah, what's amazing to, well, cause I just thought, you know, I got to be here. I got to be where it's at. And so I was down and I was just listening to what was being chanted and, you know, the politicians and what they were speaking about. But I want to tell you this, this is really cool because I think it goes to your work. Uh, there was a guy there that was representing the Democrats for life. And, you know, I've been told there are 20 million pro-life Democrats and he was getting plastered i mean he was just getting wow. beat up so i stood with him and we were debating these people and stuff and finally this is and that's what i want to get to because I, I want to get to your next op-ed about the you know democrats extreme agenda really and so finally we're talking to these this guy and these couple of girls and and i finally looked at him and said do you know why we're here and he goes well you know probably to just rub our noses in it i said no 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 do you think i said we're here for you and he said, what do you mean? And I said, the agenda that you're hearing being proclaimed, not the pro-life, but the other agenda, they believe that there's a point in time where people who have power can determine whether your life is worth living or not. Mm. And I said, we're here to say no human being has that right. Oh and so goodness. your life has purpose. We're here for you. And the, uh, to a person, they said, are you, are you serious? And I said, yeah. And, and they looked at each other and said, well, we used to think that way, but we we didn't think that way was possible anymore. And they went wow. kind of they walked away, kind of talking to each other, you know. And nice. I thought, so again, I think that's what I love about your movement because you you gave us a lot of ways to have that kind of conversation. We're not here defending ourselves, and we are obviously defending the unborn, but we're also saying the lives of the people, even that we disagree with, they're precious, they're oh, sacred. Yeah. And so I, that's why I loved your op-ed. And that's another reason I want to have you on the, you, you talked about the extreme abortion agenda is out of touch with the American public. And I think, so talk about that because it was a great article, but also I think the veneer of respectability, you know, they could just say it was a constitutional right and you didn't even have to talk anymore. Well, now that that's, and it never was, but now that right. that's been removed, they have to actually talk about what it is they're supporting. And you pointed out that their agenda is incredibly extreme. So talk to that a little bit as well. 
I would, I would just absolutely love to. And, and let me make this, uh, this sort of differentiation right at the get go, which I feel is really kind of in a way what you were just doing, Greg, differently. But so we're not talking about a specific person, um, so to speak right now, what we are talking about is, is a group that has signed on to an agenda. So we right. know I, I say that because it's so important to differentiate, like our goal in building a culture of life is to change hearts and minds. Period. And I love what you were doing at the Supreme Court, because I think you were doing that. And it's so critical that we don't see our enemy here as the Democrats, the pro-abortion politicians. The enemy is the lie that abortion is good for women. It's the lie that abortion is good for women. But yes, sadly, it is the case that the Democrats have aligned with this out of touch policy. I mean, even people who identify as being pro-choice in the United right. States are not favorable towards this. So that the policy is abortion on demand, so unlimited, until birth, paid right. for by your tax dollars, paid for by your tax dollars. So we have to do our part, right, in, in changing hearts and minds so that no one would want to vote for something this crazy, which would put us up there with North Korea, China, right. you know, I mean, et cetera, in terms of allowing abortion up until birth. Um, so, yeah, it, it just to talk to that too. I mean, I, I correct me if I'm wrong. I thought it was 14 weeks, but Western Europe doesn't have abortion after is either 12 or 14 weeks. Correct. That's right. It depends on which country it is. France, okay. 12, 12 weeks, uh, wow. Germany. I think it might be, it's 12 or maybe even earlier. Um, and, uh, the UK, I think it's 14. So it depends on what, but yes, most of Europe, um, is much more quote unquote conservative on this issue than we are. They're much more protective of the inherent dignity of the unborn child. Isn't that amazing? See, and that's what I'm saying. Again, we've been caricatured as the extremists when we are talking about your universal human dignity and that that's worth fighting for for everybody. And somehow it, it's been flipped around, like you said. And that's why I love the, the March for Life, because I think what I loved about March for Life and still do is that you created themes every year. Uh, March for Life is pro-woman. March for Life is, is, is pro-family. March for Life is pro-child. March for Life is pro-science. March for Life is pro-man, pro-husband. You know, all these different things that you created. And it and people were saying, wow, that just seems like a really big perspective. And you were saying, of course it is. Talk now. OK, so Dobbs actually overturns Roe and it really, you know, it, it gets rid of a spurious case that actually made a constitutional right. Uh, you know, I always said it this way. For the first time in our history, I guess we were proud of this. I guess second time because we talked to slavery was the first time. A human being who had power and had authority could decide whether you lived or died. And the state backed it. That's what's so unique about Roe v. Wade is that the state was backing this this mm -hmm. Whereas the state usually protects the innocent. The state usually protects the vulnerable. That's the reason to have a state. And and so right. this was an incre incredible thing. And like you said, it, this is about men, women, children, and the dignity of all of their lives. And so that's what we're about. So where does this leave us now? What's the March for Life going to do about messaging? And, and how, do, how do you continue this work? Okay. Lot packed in there. So let me yeah. just, so let me yeah. start. <laughs> we can talk for hours. Okay. Uh, so so first, where does this leave us? Let right. me uh, do a quick sort of state of the states here. So if you were going to do a snapshot just today is what's happening in the country. So you would see twenty two states have very life protective laws that were enacted quickly. So these could be heartbeat laws. They might even be life at conception laws. And some of those sadly are already in the courts. Um, so they're being fought, right. but that's, we're seeing that there are 28 states that are the opposite. You know, these are the Californias, the New Yorks of the world. The, the first group that I mentioned, those are like the Texases, the North Dakotas of the world. So um, we've got 28 states that are the opposite. They're um, becoming like abortion tourism states, basically protecting women that want to come there, um, expanding, you know, access paid for by tax dollars, et cetera. And then um, you've got one state, Florida, that has a 15 week ban. So that's that's one that's kind of in the middle. Now, when you look at all of that and you consider what that will mean for lives saved in the year ahead, we anticipate 
that approximately 200,000 babies will be saved. Babies and moms will be saved from abortion in the year ahead. So about a fourth, a little bit less, um, cause there are over 900,000 abortions in our country every year. So we're, we're talking, um, many abortions still happening in this country, although certainly down ticking and moving in the right direction. Um, so we work for that day when abortion is unthinkable. You know, we work for that day when we're just changing hearts and minds and people don't want to choose abortion, but that's kind of the political and the, the policy sort of lay of the land right now. Now, the other thing that's important to take into account legislatively is that there are still many battles at the federal level. There's this erroneous line of thought that it's 100% gone back to the states. Oh. The states have so much more freedom, so much more freedom than they've ever had before. But what we saw in the days following the Dobbs decision, for example, was the Women's Health Protection Act, um, the right. most extreme piece of pro-abortion policy that's ever gone before our Congress. And thankfully it failed to be enacted. But if the Women's Health Protection Act were passed, it would go much farther than Roe. It would codify um, a, it, the right to abortion in our country, but it would bypass and override those 22 states that I mentioned that have very life protective laws. Right. So that's one thing. Another thing at the federal level is very simple. And it's enacted every year. The Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment is arguably the most impactful pro-life policy ever in the United States. It's very simple. It prohibits taxpayer funding from abortion. So taxpayer right. funding does not go for most, not all, but most abortions. Uh, the Hyde Amendment is up for grabs now. We have to fight for that every single year. And it's attached on to the appropriations bills. So even and that has arguably saved over two million lives since it was first enacted in the late 1970s. So we are fighting for the Hyde Amendment every year, which until now has just been seen as like we all agree on this. It's, you know, bipartisan, but no more, no more. So oh. so we have our federal battles absolutely cut out for us. And then we have our state battles um, and we can we've got a lot more freedom at the states. Um, but legislatively, there's no lack of work, some might argue. There's more work to be done in a post-Roe right. America. And so we'll we'll be talking about that at the March for Life this year. So that's a little bit of the the legislative arena. Yeah. And, you know, I also like to tell people, so one of the reasons I'm in Washington representing our churches, our schools, our preschools, our universities is because uh, there are people who are federalizing everything. And that's actually that's actually counter uh, to the spirit of our country, which was to leave the big questions of life into the hands of free citizens who are religiously motivated, self-disciplined and without government coercion, able to deal with their neighbors. And so, you know, what's amazing is even when Roe was enacted, there was all this pro-life legislation happening in the states back in 73. And they decided the best way to win was to take it to the courts or federalize. It. And that's yeah. exactly what they did then. And like you said, that's exactly what they're trying to do now. And so we'll we'll keep fighting with you in D.C., no doubt whatsoever. But like you said, Thank we've got to still fight in D.C., but also now we've got to we've got to take the fight to the states as well. Correct. Absolutely. And so the March for Life began a state march initiative. A number of years ago, little did we know, I did not know in my mind and heart that Roe would be overturned. Who would have ever I thought? Really I know I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime, but we did begin a state march initiative back in 2018. Our first was in 2019 in Virginia. This year we were in five states. Uh, a week ago tomorrow, I was in uh, Ohio. So so this year we were in uh, Connecticut, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and California. And the, the new ones there were Connecticut and Ohio. Um, Pennsylvania was just maybe two and a half weeks ago or three weeks ago. We had over 5,000 out for that. It was a tremendous march. Um, very little counter protesting, which was also a delight. Right. And then just last week, like I said, we were in Ohio, uh, about 4,000 out for that. The messaging was so positive. It was all about leading with love and, and fighting the battle with love. And, um, again, pretty much, no counter protesters there. So a very safe, joyful, young, very young march. Um, so we are very much working at the level of the states, but it's it's like the both and. We can't let go of what's happening at the federal level either because um, 
that could undermine all the work that we're doing at the states. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, in your article, too, you see a lot of people, they said, you know, the charge as well. You just care about the baby. You don't care about the mother. You know, again, first of all, um, fathers and mothers and children, the first thing we should do is care about our own children. I mean, that, that should be the first, this idea that somehow I, other people have to care for my children. That's a kind of a, a strange thing, but let's say a woman in crisis or a person in crisis, or again, someone who's forced to do something they don't want to do. You talk about how there's a, in a lot of these States that are saying no to abortion, they're, they're saying yes to that mother. They're saying yes to that family, yes to trying to keep them together. You talked about the the tax credit, I think, in Mississippi. You talked about uh, yeah. what's going on in Texas for, and even our Lutheran Church has put a million dollars forth to to positive pro life initiatives for our churches and ministries around the world. You know, so again, this caricature that we don't care uh, is actually the opposite because without a whole lot of money. We care a lot, whereas the abortion lobby has tons of money and they're focused on yeah. one thing. So talk a little I, bit I about that. I agree more. Yeah. So we, so yes. So, I mean, sort of 30,000 foot view, we've been talking about legislation. I think this, this topic, one way that you could look at it is the safety net that we need to be there with an increased strengthened safety net for families that are facing unexpected pregnancies. And the truth of the matter is part of that is, as you're saying, Greg, telling the story of what's already being done, but we need to do more. So sure. what is already being done? Well, collectively, pregnancy care centers, which by the way, are over 3,000 in number around the country, they offer over $270 million in free resources to women and families facing unexpected pregnancies every year. You know, this is diaper, diapers, healthcare, formulas, um, you, know, you name it. So those are pregnancy care centers helping a woman in crisis wow. in that moment. And then there's maternity homes, which go way farther than PRC. So these are homes. There are over 300 of them around the country. This is where moms can go and live there for years, for a few years to get really, truly back on their feet, to go back to college, to get the job, to get the training, to get to have their basic you know, food and shelter taken care of. Um, so there are a few in my area that we absolutely love. Mary Shelter, um, the Paul Stefan Foundation. I heard of one, the St. Gianna Beretta Mola Foundation out in North Dakota last week. I mean, there are so many wonderful pregnancy care centers. And then, Greg, as you mentioned, uh, some of the states are coming alongside and, and they're developing funding streams. You mentioned Texas, Mississippi, Indiana is doing the same. So there are some great states that are offering funding for these maternity homes and pregnancy care centers um, and uh, churches, as you mentioned. So your church, I know my church is increasing their support. We are trying to increase our support. So I do think that we need to you know, put our money where our mouth is, all of us personally, and think about what can we right. do to, you know, help women in these scenarios. And what does that look like? I mean, I know I personally had a few friends choose abortion um, and extended right. family, and they so profoundly regret it. And I would never want my worst enemy to go through that situation that they went through. And it's so important, even on a podcast like yours, to remind women that there's always hope and healing that there is no you know sin or choice that is too dark it this is this is a hard one and we all know people who've been impacted by this and there's always hope in christ and forgiveness in christ and so you know we come into the light the light of christ here and um and it's so critical that we also know that we are in a culture of walking wounded in the sense that many people right. have war wounds here and so when we see such anger after coming you know this Dobbs decision and what have you that is because we are in a culture of walking wounded and so so yes we have to do everything we can to support moms in need and families in need and to choose what's what's right to help them choose the empowering choice the the joyful choice life Right. Life. Well, you know, it's it, it, again, the Bible teaches and this is what we teach too. that we're all 100 percent sinners. I mean, the, yes. not not 99, not 98. Yes. That, that, right. this, this idea that Christians think that they're better than everybody else. It's actually the opposite, folks. We know what we are without God, without Christ, but we know who he is for us. And we want you to know the same. And so we're willing. I just gave a I just gave a lecture this morning called that we're spiritual first responders and that we run into people's fires because 
the fire burns around all of us, but God gives us the ability as broken healers and as people who've been, you know, rescued from our own fires uh, yes. to go in and do the same. So, you know, I'm with you on that. And I think that's what people need to understand. We're, we're actually love this ruling because for the first time now we can start with this notion that life is sacred and that powers like the state can't take it away just because they determine it's not viable from their own definitions. Now let's go forward to talk about how we can love and care and serve each other, even people um, who may not agree with our views on a lot of these things, but we still reach out to them and say, but your life is precious too. All right, here's the thing. This March for Life, now it's... are we now switching it to the Dobbs date or are we in March or in January? Still? We won't. No, 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 no. We won't because, uh, well, first of all, you know, the large audience that we bring to the March for Life is right. young. It's school. So after speaking with some college presidents and what have you, we're not changing it to June. We would lose a lot of our school. <laughs> that's right. I know. Uh, I'm just teasing. But, it- <laughs> but the other piece of that is uh, – it's it's really you know when you go into the holocaust museum there's this beautiful hall of remembrance that talks about how we can't forget what's happened and we need to tell our children and we need to remember i think there's something listen roe is a dark it is a dark mark in our country's history and we can't suddenly it's it is a victory it is a massive victory our work is not yet done but we also can't forget, like we need to remember and tell this story. Um, and this year, celebrate, celebrate that we've gotten to this moment of culture. But this isn't something that we suddenly like do away with or take an eraser or any. It's it's it is part of our story. And we never want to go back and redo that story. Yeah, it is. I was just teasing because it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Hear that? I'm yeah, just yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, what what would we do without our our our, our hats on, and what would we do without our parkas on, and all that yeah. kind of stuff? No. It, and again, uh, for those of you who have never been to a march for life, I, I would encourage you. Um, and 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 Jeannie, in just a minute, I want you to you know give your website and Great. date, and and again the theme. But folks, it, it's the most positive huge gathering I've been at. And I've been at a lot of part of my job in DC is to be in the middle of stuff. And I've been at a lot of these protests. I've been at a lot. It's one of the most positive things I have ever seen. And what's amazing is people still try to caricature it like it's negative or they try to caricature it like it's small. It's an incredibly young spirited group of people and a lot of them and celebrating something. And they're even celebrating the lives of those with whom they disagree. So talk again about this year's March for Life. When is it? And what's the theme again? And why is that something? Tell us what it means that we're going to be celebrating again. So, uh, we okay, so the, the March for Life is January 20th, 2023. This is going to be the 50th annual March for Life. Life, the first post row March for Life. Wow. Um, we've got lots of wonderful events. There's an expo the few days before. There's a rose dinner. We're just about to announce in the next day or so who our rose dinner keynote is. We've got a great lineup of speakers. We haven't started announcing them yet um, for the March itself. So check us out at marchforlife.org. And and our theme that I'm so delighted to announce. So every year we try to choose, you know, there's so much confusion in culture. And as you mentioned, Greg, we've had like pro-life is pro-science, pro-life is pro-woman, adoption, a noble decision, all these different. We try to really speak into the confusion. Right. This year, it's very simple and very apropos with, with the history of, the, of what's happened this year. It is next steps colon, marching in a post-Roe America. So what does it look like? Next steps, marching in a post-Roe America. We are going to celebrate that Roe has been overturned. We are going to thank those who marched before us historically, and we are going to lay out a strategic plan for building a culture of life because arguably the next 50 years are maybe even more important. Incredible. Well, again, it's what a joy to talk to you. Thank you, Greg. It's such a delight to talk with you always. I'm always reminded of how much I appreciate you. Thank you and God bless you. God God bless you. Thanks for tuning in today. To get to know our LCRL DC work better, check out our website at lcrlfreedom.org. Contained there are resources to empower your public square dynamic discipleship. Till next time, God bless you always. I'm Greg Seltz. Have a great week. 
You've been listening to Liberty Action Alert with Greg Seltz, Executive Director of the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. This program has been brought to you by the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty. 